The Slow Mutants 1. The gunslinger spoke slowly to Jake in the rising and falling inflections of one who speaks in his sleep. There were three of us that night, Cuthbert, Elaine, and me. We weren't supposed to be there because none of us had passed from the time of children. We were still in our clouts, as the saying went. If we'd been caught, court would have stripped us bloody. But we weren't. I don't think any of the ones that went before us were caught either. Boys must put on their father's pants in private, strut them in front of the mirror, and then sneak them back on their hangers. It was like that. The father pretends he doesn't notice the new way the pants are hung up or the traces of boot polish mustache is still under their noses. Do you see? The boy said nothing. He said nothing since they had passed from the daylight. The gunslinger, on the other hand, had talked hectically, feverishly, to fill the silence. He had not looked back at the light as they passed into the land beneath the mountains, but the boy had. The gunslinger had read the falling of the day in the soft mirror of Jake's cheek, now faint rose, now milk glass, now pallid silver, now the last dusk glow touch of evening, now nothing. The gunslinger had struck a false light and they had gone on. Finally they camped. No echo from the man in black returned to them. Perhaps he had stopped to rest too. Or perhaps he floated onward without running lights through nighted chambers. The sawing night cotillion, the Kamala, some of the older folk called it, after the word for rice, was held once a year in the Western Hall, the gunslinger went on. The proper name was the Hall of Grandfathers, but to us it was only the Western Hall. The sound of dripping water came to their ears, a courting rite, as any spring dance surely is. The gunslinger laughed deprecatingly. The insensate walls turned the sound into a loon-like wheeze. In the old days, the books say, it was the welcoming of spring, what was sometimes called New Earth or Fresh Kamala, but civilization, you know. He trailed off, unable to describe the change inherent in that featureless noun, the death of romance, and the lingering of its sterile, carnal revenant, a world living on the forced respiration of glitter and ceremony, the geometric steps make-believe courtship during the sewing night's cotille that had replaced the truer, madder, scribble-scrabble of love, which he could only intuit dimly. Hollow grandeur in the place of true passions which might once have built kingdoms and sustained them. He found the truth with Susan Delgado in Magus, only to lose it again. Once there was a king, he might have told the boy. The eld whose blood, attenuated through it may be, still flows in my veins. But kings are done, lad, in the world of light anyway. They made something decadent out of it, the gunslinger said at last. A play. A game. In his voice was all the unconscious distaste of the ascetic and the eremite. His face, had the, there been stronger light to illuminate it, would have shown harshness and sorrow, the purest kind of condemnation. His essential force had not been cut or diluted by the passage of years. The lack of imagination that still remained in that face was remarkable. But the ball, the gunslinger said, the sewing night cotille, the boy did not speak, did not ask. There were crystal chandeliers, heavy glass with electric spark lights. It was all light, it was an island of light. We sneaked into one of the old balconies, the ones that were supposed to be unsafe and roped off, but we were boys and boys will be boys, so they will. To us everything was dangerous, but what of that? Had we not been made to live forever? We thought so, and even we sp when we spoke to each other of our glorious deaths. We were above everyone, and could look down on everything. I don't remember that any of us said anything. We only drank it up with our eyes. There was a great stone table where the gunslingers and their women sat at meat, watching the dancers. A few of the gunslingers also danced, but only a few. They were the young ones. 
The one who sprang the trap on Hax was one of the dancers, I seem to recall. The elders only sat, and it seemed to me that they were half embarrassed in all that light, all that civilized light. They were revered ones, the feared ones, the guardians, but they seemed to like hostlers in the crowd of cavaliers with their soft women. There were four circular tables loaded with food, and they turned all the time. The cook's boys never stopped coming and going from seven until three o'clock in the next morning. The tables were like clocks, and we could smell roast pork, beef, lobster, chickens, baked apples. The odors changed as the tables turned. There were ices and candles. There were great flaming skewers of meat. Martin sat next to my mother and father. I knew them even from so high above, and once she and Martin danced, slowly and revolvingly, the others cleared the floor for them and clapped when it was over. The gunslingers did not clap, but my father stood slowly and held his hands out to her, and she went to him, smiling, holding out her own. It was a moment of enormous gravity. Even we felt it in our high hiding place. My father had by then taken control of his katet, you must ken, the tet of the gun, and was on the verge of becoming Din of Gilead, if not all in the world. The rest knew it. Martin knew it better than any, except for perhaps Gabrielle Veris that was. The boy spoke at last with seeming reluctance. She was your mother? Aye. Gabrielle of the Waters, daughter of Alan, wife of Stephen, mother of Roland. The gunslinger spread his hands apart in a mocking little gesture that seemed to say, Here I am, and what of it? Then dropped them into his lap again. My father was the last lord of light. The gunslinger looked down at his hands. The boy said nothing more. I remember how they danced, the gunslinger said. My mother and Martin, the gunslinger's counselor. I remember how they danced, revolving slowly together and apart in the old steps of courtship. He looked at the boy, smiling. But it meant nothing, you know, because power had been passed in some way that none of them knew, but all understood, and my mother was grown root and branch to the holder and wielder of that power. Was it not so? She went to him when the dance was over, didn't she? And clasped his hands? Did they applaud? Did the hall ring with it, as those pretty boys and their soft ladies applauded and applauded him? Did it? Did it? Bitter water dripped distantly in the darkness. The boy said nothing. I remember how they danced, the gunslinger said softly. I remember how they danced. He looked up at the unseeable stone roof and it seemed for a moment that he might scream at it, rail at it, challenge it blindly. Those blind and tongueless tonnages of granite that now bore their tiny lives like microbes in its stone intestines. What hand could have held the knife that did my father to his death? I'm tired, the boy said, and then again said no more. <laughs> the gunslinger lapsed into silence and the boy laid over and put one hand between his cheek and the stone. The little flame in front of them guttered. The gunslinger rolled the smoke. It seemed he could see the crystal light still in the eyes of his memory hear the shout of accolade, empty in a husk-held land that stood even then hopeless against the grey ocean of time. Remembering that an island of light hurt him bitterly, and he wished he had never held witness to it, or to his father's cuckoldry. He passed smoke between his mouth and his nostrils, looking down at the boy. How we make little circles in the earth for ourselves, he thought. Around we go, back to the start, and to the start is there again. Resumption, which was never the course of daylight. How long before we see daylight again? He slept. After the sound of his breathing had become long and steady and regular, the boy opened his eyes and looked at the gunslinger with an expression of sickness and love. The last light of the fire caught in one pupil for a moment and was drowned there. He went to sleep. Two. The gunslinger had lost most of his time since in the desert, which was changeless. He lost the rest of it here in the passage under the mountains, which was lightless. 
Neither of them had any means of telling the clock, and the concept of hours became meaningless. Ab negate. In a sense, they stood outside of time. A day might have been a week, or a week a day. They walked, they slept, they ate thin meals that did not satisfy their bellies. Their only companion was a steady, thundering rush of the water, drilling its auger's path through the stone. They followed it and drank from its flat, mineral-salted depth, hoping there was nothing in it that would make them sick or kill them. At times, the gunslinger thought he saw fugitive driftings light, like corpse lamps beneath its surface, but supposed they were only projections of his brain, which had not forgotten the light. Still, he cautioned the boy not to put his feet in the water. The rangefinder in his head took them on steadily. The path beside the river, for it was a path, smooth and sunk into a slight concavity, led always upwards towards the river's head. At regular intervals they came to curved stone pylons with sunken ring bolts, perhaps when oxen or strangle horse had been tethered there. At each was a steel flagon holding an electric torch, but these were all barren of life and light. During the third period of rest before sleep, the boy wandered away a little. The gunslinger could hear small conversations of rattle pebbles as Jake moved cautiously. Careful, he said. You can't see where you are. I'm crawling. It's... Say, what is it? The gunslinger half crouched, touching the haft of his gun. There was a slight pause. The gunslinger strained his eyes uselessly. I think it's a railroad. The boy said dubiously. The gunslinger got up and walked towards the sound of Jake's voice, leading with one foot lightly to the test of pitfalls. Here! A hand reached out and cats pawed the gunslinger's face. The boy was very good in the dark, better than Roland himself. His eyes seemed to dilate until there was no color left in them. The gunslinger saw this as he struck a meager light. There was no fuel in this rock room, and what they had brought with them was going rapidly to ash. At times, he urged to strike a light was well nigh insatiable. They had discovered one could grow as hungry for light as for food. The boy was standing beside a curved rock wall that was lined with parallel metal staves running off into the darkness. Each carried black nodes that might once have been conductors of electricity and besides and below, set only inches off the stone floor, were tracks of bright metal. What might have run on those tracks at one time? The gunslinger could only imagine sleek electric bullets firing the courses through the forever night with affrighted searchlight eyes going before. He had never heard of such things, but there were many remnants of the gone world, just as there were demons. The gunslinger had once come upon a hermit, who gained a quasi-religious power over a miserable flock of kind keepers by the possession of an ancient gasoline pump. The hermit crouched beside it, one arm wrapped possessively around it, and preached while guttering sermons. The he occasionally placed the still bright steel nozzle, which was attached to the rotted rubber hose between his legs. On the pump, in perfectly legible, although rust-clotted letters, was a legend of unknown meaning. A moko, lead free. A moko had been the totem of a thunder god, and they had worshipped him with the slaughter of sheep and the sound of engines. Rum, 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 rum. Hulks, the gunslinger thought. Only meaningless hulks poking from sands that once were seas. And now a railroad. We'll follow it, he said. The boy said nothing. The gunslinger extinguished the light, and they slept. When Roland awoke, the boy was up before him, sitting on one of the rails, watching him sightlessly in the dark. They followed the rails like blind men, Roland leading, Jake following. They slipped their feet along one rail always, also like blind men. The steady rush of the river off to the right was their companion. They did not speak, and this went on for three periods of waking. The gunslinger felt no urge to think coherently or to plan. His sleep was dreamless. During the fourth period of walking and walking, they literally stumbled on a hand car. The gunslinger ran into it chest high and the boy, walking on the other side, struck his forehead and went down with a cry. The gunslinger made a light immediately. Are you alright? The gunslinger sounded sharp, angry, and he winced at them. Yes, 
The boy was holding his head gingerly. He shook it once to make sure he had told the truth. They turned to look at what they had run into. It was a flat square plate of metal that sat mutely on the tracks. There was a seesaw handle in the center of the square. It descended into a connection of cogs. The gunslinger had no immediate sense of the thing's purpose, but the boy grasped it at once. It's a hand car! What? A hand car, the boy said impatiently. Like in the old cartoons, look! He pulled himself up and went to the handle. He managed to push it down, but it took all his weight hung over the handle to do this trick. The hand car moved the foot, with silent timeless on the rails. Good, a faint mechanical voice. It made them both jump. Good, push, ugh. The mechanical voice died out. It works a little hard, the boy said if apologizing for the thing. The gunslinger pulled himself up beside Jake and shoved the handle down. The handguard moved again, forward obediently, and then stopped. Good! Push again! The mechanical voice encouraged. He had felt a drive shaft turn beneath his feet. The operation pleased him, and so did the mechanical voice, although he intended to listen to that no longer than necessary. Other than the pump at the way station, this was the first machine he'd seen in years that still worked. But the thing disquieted him too. It would take them to their destination that much quicker. He had no doubt whatever that the man in black had meant for them to find this too. Neat, huh? The boy said, and his voice was full of loathing. The silence was deep. Roland could hear his organs at work inside his body, and a drip of water and nothing else. You stand on one side, I'll stand on the other, Jake said. You will have to push by yourself until it gets rolling. Then I can help. First you push, then I push. We'll go right along. Get it? I get it, the gunslinger said. His hands were in helpless, despairing fists. But you'll have to push by yourself until it gets rolling good, the boy repeated, looking at him. The gunslinger had a sudden vivid picture of the Great Hall a year or so after the sowing night cotillion. By then, it had been nothing but shattered shards in the wake of the revolt, civil strife, and invasion. This image was followed by one of Allie, the scarred woman from Tull, pushed and pulled by bullets that were killing her for no reason at all, unless reflex was a reason. Next came Cuthbert Aldgood's face, laughing as he went downhill to his death, still blowing that goddamn horn, and then he saw Susan's face, twisted, made ugly with weeping. All my old friends, the gunslinger thought and smiled hideously. I'll push, the gunslinger said. He began to push, and a voice began to speak. Good, push again. Good, push again. He sent his hand fumbling along the post upon which the seesaw handle had been balanced. At last he found what he was surely looking for, a button. He pushed it. Goodbye, pal, the mechanical voice said cheerily and was blessedly silent for some hours. 3. They rolled on through the dark faster now, no longer having to feel their way. The mechanical voice spoke up once, suggesting that they eat crispala, and then again to say that nothing satisfied at the end of the hard day, like larches. Following the second piece of advice, it spoke no more. Once the awkwardness of a buried age had run off the hand car, it went smoothly. The boy tried to do his share, and the gunslinger allowed him small shifts, but mostly he pumped by himself, in large and chest-striking rising and fallings. The underground river was their companion, sometimes closer on the right, sometimes further away. Once it took on a huge thunderous hollowness, as if passing through some great cathedral, Narthex. Once the sound of it disappeared, almost altogether. The speed and the made wind against their faces seemed to take the place of sight and to drop them once again into the frame of time. The gunslinger estimated they were making anywhere from 10 to 15 miles an hour, always on a shallow, almost unperceivable uphill grade that wore him out deceptively. When they stopped, he slept like the stone itself. Their food was almost gone now. Neither of them worried about it. For the gunslinger, the tensestness of coming climax was imperceivable but as real and accretive as the fatigue of propelling the hand car. They were close to the end of the beginning, or at least he was. 
He felt like a performer placed on a center stage minutes before the rise of the curtain, settled in position with his first line held securely in his mind. He heard the unseen audience rattling programs and settling in their seats. He lived with a tight, tidy ball of unholy anticipation in his belly and welcomed the exercise that let him sleep. And when he did sleep, it was like the dead. The sp boy spoke less and less, but at their stopping place, one sleep period not long before they were attacked by the slow mutants, he asked the gunslinger almost shyly about his coming of age. For w I would hear more of that, he said. The gunslinger had been leaning on his back against the handle, a cigarette from his dwindling supply of tobacco clamped in his lips. He'd been on the verge of his usual unthinking sleep when the boy asked the question. Why would these still know that? He asked, amused. The boy's voice was curiously stubborn, as if hiding embarrassment. I just would. And after a pause, he added, I always wondered about growing up. I bet it's mostly lies. What you'd hear wasn't about my growing up, the gunslinger said. I suppose I did the first of that not long after what they heard of. When you fought your teacher, Jake said remotely, that's what I want to hear. Roland nodded. Yes, of course, the day he had tried the line. That was a story any boy might want to hear all right. My real growing up didn't start after my da sent me away. I finished doing it at one place and another along the way. He paused. I saw not a man hung once. A not man? I don't understand. You could feel him, but you couldn't see him. Jake nodded, seeming to understand. He was invisible. Roland raised his eyebrows. He had never heard the word before. Do you say so? Yes. Then let it be so. In any case, there were folk who didn't want me to do it. Felt they'd be cursed if I did it. But the fellow had gotten a taste for rape. Do you know what that is? Yes, Jake said. And I bet an invisible guy would be good at it too. How did you catch him? That's a tale for another day. Knowing there would be no other days. Both of them knowing there would be no other days. Two years after that, I left a girl in a place called Kingstown, although I didn't want to. Sure you did, the boy said and the contempt in his voice was no less for the softness of his tone. Got to catch up with the tower, am I right? Got to keep on riding, just like the cowboys on my dad's network. Roland felt his face flush with the heat in the dark, but when he spoke his voice was even. That was the last part, I guess, of my growing up, I mean. I never knew any of the parts when they happened, only later did I know that. He realized with some unease that he was avoiding what the boy wanted to hear. I suppose the coming of age was part of it, he said almost grudgingly. It was formal, almost stylized, like a dance. He laughed unpleasantly. The boy said nothing. It was necessary to prove oneself in battle, the gunslinger began. And with that, I'll thank you for listening, for staying with us for another part of Margin Reading. And um, we'll see you tomorrow, and apparently we'll be going back to Inworld, and we will witness the tale of how Roland became a man in the Inworld laws. Long days and pleasant nights to you, listener.